Welcome to the Daily Race. We are starting a brand new study today. We are going through the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel uh, is labeled as one of the major prophets. Um, first of all, his book is really long. Uh, it's 40 chapters, uh, so it's, it's a longer book of the Bible. Uh, we're going to cover it about two weeks, um, and the reason why we're going to do that is because there's a lot of a lot of parallel stuff. So this fits right in the history of the exile. So Ezekiel is a contemporary of Jeremiah. They overlap a little bit. Jeremiah is kind of pre-exile into, um, you know, warning people that, that uh, destruction was coming and into the first couple waves of it. Uh, Ezekiel uh, picks it up. Um, well, his prophecy doesn't start until they're five years in. He is actually exiled, and he's five years into that. And we, we learn that um, in the very first verses here of, of Ezekiel that we're going to read. Uh, it's Ezekiel's very well organized. So whereas Jeremiah kind of jumps back and forth a little bit into time with different visions, Ezekiel is very straightforward. There's a lot of dates that are dropped in, like really specific dates uh, that um, when when messages are, are given to him. So um, that's that's really great that it's organized that way. Uh, it's divided into kind of three sections. So uh, chapters one through twenty four are all pre destruction of Jerusalem. So remember, as we were talking through Jeremiah, there are waves to the exile. There are waves to captives being taken away. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is taking more and more control over over Israel, where he finally, eventually, utterly destroys Jerusalem, wipes it out completely, destroys the temple. Those are kind of the, the final prophecies there in in Jeremiah that that um, uh, that we we read. Uh, so. The first 24 uh, chapters of Ezekiel are before that event. It's, it's between the first wave of captives being taken and this taking place. Uh, then there are some, some prophecies about the surrounding nations. And then finally, after that is post that event. And uh, we'll, we'll get into to, to all of that as we go. So we're going to kind of move a little bit quicker through the first part of it since a lot of that is those prophecies are... Uh, covered by Jeremiah, They're very kind of saying the same types of things. We'll bring out some highlights that, that are distinctive there. Uh, Ezekiel is a prophetic book, so um, we read it as as prophecy. Uh, we read it as prophecy. Uh, that's that's important there, though. This isn't narrative. This isn't history. This isn't poetry. It's prophecy. Uh, we will see a lot of parallel. Well, actually, we'll see more of the parallel in a couple weeks when we do Revelation. Uh, so uh, the same type of language is used. John borrows uh, a lot of language from Ezekiel as he you, as he gives the prophecy in Revelation. Ezekiel was talked about and, and studied a lot in first century Judaism because of everything that is going on. I mean, they're being uh, uh, ruin, ruled by the Romans. Uh, there's all this tension. There's this hope that God is coming soon. Um, the restoration of Israel, all of these things that are in Ezekiel, they believe were, were, were taking place. They're looking to, to Ezekiel for guidance during this time. Many of the the prophets, the prophetic people, many of the, the revolutionaries, uh, lots of people borrowed from Ezekiel. He was on the tongue of a lot, or on the tip of the tongue of a lot of people's mouths. So we see a lot of that, that imagery used in, um, in Revelation as well. And when we get there, we'll, we'll kind of point out some of those similarities. But we'll also see here in Ezekiel a lot of um, a lot of imagery that's it's hard to understand. He's describing visions where God has brought him. It starts off bringing him into His presence. He gets to see God on His throne. So the the imagery that he uses is well, it's kind of wild. <laughs> Why? Well, because we can't explain God. So he's trying to explain God in his best terms. He's trying to explain what he's seeing there, and it's not as as clear cut as we might think. Um, uh, spoiler alert, angels don't look like the little Valentine's cherub angel. They just don't. That, that's As we're reading this, we're going to get some uh, some snapshots of some spiritual beings. Uh, uh, it's, it's more than just, just angels. Angels are messengers, uh, but there's other spiritual beings, and he's going to kind of describe some of those. So, so the imagery gets kind of a, a little bit terrifying, and, and it should be, right? Like, we're, we're talking about... Uh, the presence of God, we're talking about trying to describe things that are undescribable. He's given his best shot at it. So we're, we're going to read some of that, um, but also keep pulling this message. What, what is he saying? And the big, big overall theme of uh, Ezekiel is this, is that, yes, Israel has, has fallen short. They're being punished. God's going to rescue. 
but not because they deserve it, not because they're so great, but, but for God's own sake, he's doing this. For his own glory, he's rescuing them because it's about him and his plan. So that, that's a big theme that goes through it. So, so let me start off here in Ezekiel chapter one. It says this, on July 31st of my, 30, of my 30th year, while I was with the Judean exiles besides the Kabar River in Babylon, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. This happened during the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity. The Lord gave this message to Ezekiel, son of Buzi, the priest beside the Kabar River and the land of the Babylonians, and he felt the hand of the Lord take hold of him. All right, so very specific date here. He's, he's 30 years old, which is also the date at which uh, if you, he's from the priestly line, his active ministry as a priest would begin to take place. Now, he's not doing any temple work here because he's removed from the temple. He's been taken into exile, uh, but his ministry as a prophet coincides with the natural time that his ministry as a priest would take place. This is the first vision. It says, I looked up and saw a great storm coming from the north, driving before it a huge cloud that flashed with lightning and shone with brilliant light. There was a fire inside the cloud, and in the middle of the fire glowed something like gleaming amber. From the center of the cloud came four living beings that looked human, except they had four faces and four wings. I don't get look human except they had four faces and four wings. I would say they don't look human, but it's something about the shape of them, right? Maybe the, uh, the the standing upright made them look human, but they have four four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet had hooves like those of a calf and shone like burnished bronze. Once again, this is looking less and less human to me. Uh, under each of their four wings, I could see human hands. So each of the four uh, beings had four faces and four wings. The wings of each being being touched uh, touched the wings of the being beside it. Each one moved straight forward in any direction without turning. Uh, each human each had a human face in the front, the face of a lion on the right side and the face of ox on the left side, the face of an eagle on the back. Each had two pairs of outstretched wings, one pair uh, stretched out to touch the wings of the living being on either side of it, and the other pair covered its body. They went whatever direction the spirit chose. They moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. Uh, and then he goes on to describe these wheels that are spinning around them, that, that are sparking uh, fire. Uh, it's the point that these are otherworldly beings, that these, these are completely spiritual. These, these aren't, uh, you know, inhabitants of earth. <laughs> these aren't uh, part of the creation they would come across every day, uh, that these are, are God's created spiritual beings. It then says, uh, he eventually, we're going to fast forward here to, uh, to verse, uh, verse 22. It says, spread out, spread out above them was a surface like the sky, glittering like crystal. Beneath this surface, the wings of each living being stretched out to touch each other's wings, and each had two wings covering its body. As they flew, their wings sounded to me like waves crashing against the shore, like the voice of the Almighty, like the shouting of a mighty army. When they stopped, they let down their wings. As they stood with their wings lowered, a voice spoke from beyond the crystal surface above them. Above this surface was something that looked like a throne made of blue lapis lazul. And on this throne, high above was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. From what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like gleaming amber. So now he's looking at the throne of God, shining with splendor. All around him was a glowing halo, like a rainbow shining in the clouds on a rainy day. This is what the glory of the Lord looked like to me. When I saw it, I fell face down on the ground. I heard someone's voice speaking to me. Stand up, son of man, the voice spoke. I want to speak to you. The spirit came into me as he spoke, and he set me on my feet. I listened carefully to his words. Son of man, he said, I'm sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. And they are stubborn and hard-hearted people, but I'm sending you to say this to them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. And when they listen or refuse to listen, for remember, they are rebels, at least they will know they had a prophet among them. Son of man, do not fear them or their words. Do not be afraid, even though their threats sound uh, surround you like nettles and briars and stinging scorpions. Do not be dismayed by their dark scowls, even though they are rebels. You must give them my messages, whether they listen or not. But they won't listen, for they are completely rebellious. Son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not join them in their rebellion. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and saw 
a hand reaching out to me and held a scroll which he unrolled, and I saw that both sides were covered with funeral songs, words of sorrows, and pronouncements of doom. So, so that's a kind of a wild introduction to, to Ezekiel. That's a kind of a wild introduction to his calling. When we get to Revelation, we're going to see a very similar uh, scene, a very similar vision, where John gets to see the throne room, and he's trying to describe what he's seen there, and God puts a scroll in his mouth as well. Uh, the parallels here is that this prophet is coming during a time of great trial, uh, that God is about to deliver the rescue. It's things are bad, things are difficult, things are not going well. Uh, there's not a whole lot of hope that people are going to change their direction, but you are to be a word pointing people to what is going to happen, that God is going to rescue for his sake. Uh, that's the same here in Ezekiel. Um, as they're coming back, promising to come back from the uh, exile, that the God's going to come rescue his people, the, the first coming. And then it's parallel in Revelation as John's talking about Christ's second coming, coming back to rescue his people, make everything right. So as we start this off, there's going to be some parallels in language because the occasions are, are, are similar, first coming, second coming. Um, but Ezekiel here is, is very rooted in things that have as it starts off here, things that have already taken place. Uh, the exile, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem that they're kind of predicting moving towards here. And uh, we're going to unfold that as we go. The, the point is, though, that it's for God's sake and God's glory. Not because people deserved it, but because God made a promise that God is unfolding his story of redemption for all mankind. And regardless of whether they obey or not, he's still moving this story forward. All right. That's a big introduction here for today. We're going to continue it tomorrow. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you so much just for your word. We thank you so much just for the opportunity we have to, to look at your faithfulness, God, for your honor and glory. So God, help us to live today for that. Help us live today in response to the fact that, that you are, uh, have made promises, that you are going to return, that you fulfilled what you said you were going to do in Ezekiel, and we believe you're going to continue to fulfill your promises in our lives and in the world around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, well, hey, I hope you have a great, great rest of the day. I look forward to seeing you 24 hours from now right back here on The Daily Race. Love you guys.